So, without further ado, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Mark Pimentel. Um, those who follow microbiome field um, know Dr. Pimentel. He's, he's a legend in that field. Uh, going back uh, 25 years, he was talking about uh, the microbiome uh, at the time that nobody would even think that that's, that's a thing. Uh, so now, uh, here we are. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a field that you saw how many thousands of publications that Dr. Mathur was showing uh, that are being published every year in that field. So that vision of Mark has changed the lives of many and a management of the disease and it essentially flipped the field on its head uh, and it's a privilege to have him today. So um, what I'm gonna talk about today is, if, I, if this goes, post-infectious IBS, the road to a cure. What I'm gonna to try to do is take you through the journey and the story, and you'll hear a little bit of overlap between my talk and Dr. Nasser's talk after me, because I'm trying to show you how you get to SIBO, how you get to that point, and, and what, the, what the circumstances are. But I do wanna go and start in 1996, which is what IBS used to be thought of when we first, you know, when I first started my fellowship, for example. So IBS circa 1996, no FDA approved drugs for IBS. That early life trauma, anxiety, depression, and that IBS is a female disease, which is a really derogatory term, not to mention the term at the bottom, IBS is a disease of hysterical women. This is literally what a doctor said uh, on a podium. So these, these are bad things to say. This is not true. This is not what IBS is. It is now we believe, an organic disease. But this is, these are the therapies we had. So if you had diarrhea, well, take an anti-diarrheal. That's it. Solve the problem. If you had constipation, take a laxative. Solve the problem. But never sort of thinking about, well, how do you treat the cause? What's the cause? If you treat the cause, they get really better, not just me. I always say in my uh, talks, diarrhea is not a treatment for constipation. And constipation is not a treatment for diarrhea because that's just making you the opposite and bad in the opposite direction. So uh, I think that's, that's the point of this slide is to say we've come a long way. What we do think is happening now 26, 27 years later is that food poisoning starts this whole thing. So whether it's E. coli or, Klebs or, e. coli or Campylobacter or Shigella or Salmonella, and when I say E. coli, I mean the pathogenic types of E. coli that you might get on a, on a vacation somewhere or eating bad food. And they all share one toxin in common, cytolethal distending toxin, which I will speak to at length, because that's what's causing, we believe, autoimmunity in people. And that autoimmunity is to particular nerves of your gut, which I'm going to show you the pictures of, and then the gut doesn't move well. The gut's cleaning waves that Dr. Rezai showed earlier, which sort of sets up this whole story, they don't work. And when they don't work, you don't get cleaning. And then the debris from the food from last night by breakfast, your bowel's not clean. If it's not clean, the bacteria are gonna build up, hence overgrowth. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. But let's start with these bookends. We didn't know all about this back uh, 25, 26 years ago, but now in 2017, this is a study from the Mayo Clinic, the first author is Clem, and what we find in this is that if you look at outbreaks, so if you study, there was an outbreak in Spain where a thousand people got salmonella food poisoning and they followed them right after that. And they found that these patients developed irritable bowel syndrome. Well, if you take all those kinds of studies and mash them together, really, if you go to a wedding, 100 people go to a wedding, everybody gets food poisoning because the buffet had, you know, Campylobacter in it, 11 people after that will have IBS for an indefinite period of time which is huge, it's a, it's a significant number of people. And so we now know, point of fact, that food poisoning causes IBS. So let me just pause there for a second because if you think about the term irritable bowel syndrome, it's a very derogatory term for patients because I am saying that you are irritable, which feeds into the whole thing that it's a irritable patients, okay? that it's a bowel disorder, which is nobody wants to talk about their bowels, and that it's a syndrome, which means you're not a disease, you're not legit, you're a syndrome of, or a constellation of symptoms. And that's delegitimizing the patient. So the terminology doesn't make sense. But here we are, we know the cause of IBS. 
in a certain percentage. It's food poisoning. We don't even know this for Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. We don't know what causes Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, but because there's blood in the stool, oh, that's a serious disease and all this. But we now know more about IBS based on this, this one slide about what caused it, and yet it's still a syndrome. So a little frustrating, frustrating for me, frustrating for patients, but I just want to make that point. But can food poisoning cause overgrowth, which is the theory we think that IBS, 60% of IBS is overgrowth? And the answer is yes. So this was a study we did a long way back, 2008. Rats got Campylobacter. The other rats didn't. And then we looked to see what happened, and the rats who got Campylobacter ended up with SIBO. Not only did they have SIBO in 27% of the rats, the rats who got Campylobacter, which is the C positive, who developed SIBO, they had weird bowel function. They had wet stool. So for the first time in history, we have an animal model of post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. So what do you do with animal models? You study what's going on, and you try and figure out what, what exactly is A, B, C, D, and E, IBS, you know, the, 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 the steps. But if you think Campylobacter, you know, people don't believe that it causes IBS, that's pretty much done now, 26 years later, because there's this study. Uh, we were part of this, Will Takakura's now at Michigan. He worked with us for a while. This is the Bradford Hill criteria. So what does that mean? It means that this is the strict criteria that are used to show cause and effect in the infectious disease world. So if you want to say tuberculosis causes lung disease, now the rigorous criteria are the Bradford Hill criteria. Well, Campylobacter causes IBS meets all the Bradford Hill criteria. So we now know in 2022, full stop again, IBS in part is caused by food poisoning, and in this case, Campylobacter. But how does it work? And so one of the things that we now know is that four different organisms, you can see them on the, focus on the left first, you've got four different organisms, you've got Campylobacter, you've got Salmonella, uh, Shigella, E. coli. They're different, and you, you heard that from Dr. Leite's lecture this morning. These organisms are different, they have different staining, they have different kind of uh, um, functionality. And so how can all four of these cause IBS? Well, it turns out they have one toxin in common when they're pathogenic, and that's the CDTB toxin. So we did a series of experiments, and this is now a decade's worth of work I'm going to summarize in literally just a handful of slides, that we were able to cut that gene out of the Campylobacter, and the rats didn't get IBS. And then we had to find out, well, why is the CDTB toxin causing IBS? And we found out that the CDTB toxin has a sequence in it, a gene sequence, that's a protein sequence that's very similar to your own protein called vinculin. And so the next slide is a very complicated slide, but it took a lot of work to pull down and figure out what exactly CDTB looks like in you. And we did that over many, many years in this paper. But I'll show you what vinculin is because you need to understand this. So these are cells. This is a cell here, this is another cell here. The blue is the nucleus of the cell, and the green are the skeleton of your cells to keep the cell shaped. At the end of the lines of the skeleton is a motor, this red part, and it's a complex of four or five proteins that form like a motor that moves out so the cells can stretch out and grab onto each other. And the vinculin is part of this motor complex at the end of these strings helping cells attach. And the particular vinculin that you get autoimmunity to is present in the nerves of the gut and in the, the lining of the intestine or the skin. And so that's a really important factor when it comes to how this causes IBS or makes IBS worse. So essentially, if you have high antibodies to vinculin, it's sort of like half the house doesn't have lights because the wires don't quite reach the light bulb. So if they don't quite reach the light bulb because the, the, the fingers or the lines of the nerves aren't attaching, you get less light. And less light in this context means less migrating motor complexes. So these are the lights. Uh, these are the, uh, the nerves. These nerves, this is the normal tissue. These are the nerves that cause the cleaning wave in your gut. 
and they have to be a lot of these nerves, and they're all interconnected. You can't see the lines, but they're interconnected. Focus on this one, which is this panel. These are the nerves in the rats who got Campylobacter who now have SIBO. They are barely visible. They're not there. So you get less cleaning waves. So the next question is, do IBS patients with overgrowth have less cleaning waves? Well, we actually knew that in, in 2002, but look at this. This is the cleaning wave. Dr. Razai showed you an example of a cleaning wave. This is a little more bold example because it's blown up, but you can see how beautiful this is. So when you wake up in the morning and you hear that growling sound and you're like, oh my gosh, I should eat something because I'm going to embarrass myself in front of other people, don't. This has to come. This is a beautiful thing. It's supposed to clean your small bowel and keep it free of debris so that the overgrowth doesn't come back. But look how aggressive this is. Nothing in the upper gut looks this aggressive. This is a, a really an important function of the gut. But look what happens in IBS with SIBO. This is a normal person, how many cleaning waves they get, and look here. But look at this, 50% of irritable bowel syndrome patients with SIBO, we couldn't find even one. So it's gone, or at least it's gone for the time that we're measuring it for the six hours. And so the cleaning waves aren't working. And we now know since 1977, no cleaning waves, you get SIBO. This is not a new, this is not news. This is 1977, it's almost 50 years old information. So I'm put, starting to get the story together that this toxin is leading to this antibody that's causing the damage to the nerves of the gut and then this bacterial overgrowth part of the story. But if you really wanna prove that CDTB, that toxin is causing the problem, then forget about Campylobacter, forget about Shigella, Salmonella, all that stuff. Just give the toxin. Will it make overgrowth? Will it make IBS? So we did that. We gave the toxin like a vaccine to rats. And then we gave them a booster three weeks later, just like your COVID shot. Three weeks later, you get the second shot. And so these, ant these rats got a bunch of CDTB antibodies. So they got immune to CDTB really fast and really strongly but we never gave them vinculin. They got antibodies to vinculin. So giving the toxin made the rats form antibodies to vinculin, which means we're inducing autoimmunity by just giving this toxin. And I know this is a complicated slide, but the rats got overgrowth both in the duodenum and the ileum. And so by doing this process of the CDTB causing all that damage, you get overgrowth in these rats. So it kind of works like this. You get food poisoning. This toxin gets secreted into you and you react. You form antibodies. You don't like this toxin. You don't like any of it. You don't like this part. You don't like this part. You don't like this part. But this part purposefully looks a little like that. And as a result, you get autoimmunity to vinculin. So I'm going to show you some really technical slides, but it's not hard to understand. We did the experiment again. The rats got Campylobacter, the CDTB toxin again, antibodies go up, the stool water goes up because they're getting diarrhea, and the more the antibodies are up, the more watery their stool is. So the worse those antibodies are in a person's blood, in a rat's blood, the worse they are. But look what happened to the rats. They got SIBO, but they got two types of SIBO, two different types. They, some of the rats, like at the wedding, some people recover completely. So the orange is the control group, this is their microbiome. The green is rats who went to the wedding, got the CDTB toxin because they got food poisoning, but no problem, they did okay. But then the group that didn't do okay broke down into two distinct groups. We call them microtypes. One is too much E. coli, which is hydrogen producer. Another is desulfovibrio, which is a hydrogen sulfide producer. So why am I telling you all this complicated information? Because in the last three years, we've now defined or identified that SIBO is breaking down on the diarrhea side into two subtypes that have to be treated differently. There's the hydrogen type, which is E. coli, and I'll show you that later, and the hydrogen sulfide type, which is different and has to be treated uh, separately. So this was the problem or part of the missing pieces that we didn't have. But as a result, we now have blood test. So if you measure anti-CDTB and anti-vinculin in patients with IBS, you can diagnose that they have IBS. 
you can diagnose it with 98% post-test probability, which is really, really good. And secondly, medical certainty is over 80%, and compared to everything else in IBS, the new test, the second generation, oops, is way up here. So if you have a blood test, I'm just gonna say this again, if you have a blood test that measures something that's causing the disease or the condition, it can no longer be a syndrome. It's a disease, right? Because you have a biological variable that's abnormal. And so this actually legitimizes patients. Patients actually have a condition. This is real, this is organic, it's not in your head. There's something going on biologically. And so the way it works is you've got this beautiful microbiome, you get Campylobacter, and it's producing all this toxin. You saw these villi in some pictures that Dr. Razai showed earlier. You form antibodies to these toxins. You see the antibodies going up in your bloodstream. But the antivinculin comes later, and when it comes, you form antibodies to the nerves of your gut. You can see the nerves are coming apart the motility changes, and all these blue guys are the bad guys, the SIBO. And so that's how we think IBS now develops in about 60% of patients. But I wanted to show you this one study, and it's kind of going to overlap a little bit with Jason's talk, so I apologize to Jason for that, but it fits in the narrative here is that this is the first study in history. Breath test has been around for 40 years. This is the first time in history we have a breath test with three gases, hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide. We have the patients with diarrhea and constipation, and we have the microbiome proving that the breath test is working, that it's telling you what's going on in the gut. So these are diarrhea patients, diarrhea IBS. They weren't selected because they had overgrowth. They were put into a study for IBSD for an FDA-approved study. And this group of C patients, IBS constipation patients, were put in from another FDA-approved study. But we did breath tests. And you can see diarrhea patients, no methane, almost ever. Constipated patients, not all of them had methane, but when they did, it looked like this. The interesting part is the diarrhea patients had hydrogen. And this is the cutoff. If I draw a line right here, that's the cutoff for SIBO. And look, the majority of them were above that line, so they had SIBO in diarrhea IBS. But the other kid is hydrogen sulfide, which is definitely elevated compared to the other groups. So you have to know what you have. And we now know. We know the characters. So, so uh, hopefully Jason will cover some of this. But we know who the folks are, who the bugs are that are causing uh, SIBO. One of them for emo, for intestinal methanogen overgrowth, we identified that this is the bug. So we know one bug is causing this condition. It's M. smithii. It's an ar archaea, which uh, was covered earlier, and that it correlates directly with the breath test. So for the first time, we can say the breath test, what number you get, correlates with the number of these bad guys or bad characters in your gut, and that's why you have constipation. So this is a very important study for that reason, and it led us to understand IBS as three distinct groups of microbiome. On the diarrhea side, the hydrogen producers, just like the rats, hydrogen sulfide producer, just like the rats, and then on the constipation side, this methanobrevibacter, or this methane producer, causing the methane, causing you to be constipated. Well, we now, worldwide, acknowledge SIBO. This wasn't the case uh, a couple of decades ago, but worldwide, there's now an understanding based on this consensus, European consensus, and Asian consensus, that SIBO is important, and it is important in irritable bowel syndrome. So that's really good for you to know. I mentioned that there are three types. There's the hydrogen type, the hydrogen sulfide type, and the methane type. But what I want to emphasize is that hydrogen sulfide is the diarrhea-associated type. So in the last few minutes, I, this is the story. I've kind of given you a very quick snapshot. It literally is hours of lecture to go through each of these and show you all the details of how we got to this point. But I gave you sort of the snapshot of it. And we now know what's causing irritable bowel syndrome, and that's 60%. Now, when rifaximin came out, this is the New England Journal paper that uh, validated the two phase three studies for rifaximin. It was a, a bit of a shock because you take a drug for two weeks and you get three months of benefit or longer. 
And so you are actually treating a cause. Now, it doesn't help every single person, and this is why we have to continue our research, because rifaximin doesn't get rid of all SIBO in all patients. Maybe in part because of hydrogen sulfide, which we didn't know back then. But what we do know from Dr. Rezai's study is that breath testing does help you. Because if, you're, if you just blindly give rifaximin, you've got a 44% chance of getting better. But if you know you have SIBO, the chances go up. And a breath test is predicting that happening. Now, methane is a different story. Methanogens are archaea. We, we heard about this. It's a different kingdom of life. Uh, Dr. Mathur mentioned that. Well, we don't have antibiotics for archaea. We have antibiotics for bacteria. So we had to figure out what antibiotics might work for archaea. And it turns out if you combine neomycin and rifaximin, you get a pretty good response to constipation because it makes methane go down better. But we need to do better than this, and we are. And we've got some drugs that we're working with now that we think will supersede this and really get at it. The, the, the most important thing is if you know the bug, you can start working on a treatment. If you know the bug in this category, you can start working on the next treatment, and the same for the third category. So we have the three categories. And if you think we didn't know these three categories two years ago, we did. And, and that because research that we know now doesn't get publicly available until the paper's published. So we know things that that uh, are already two years in the future, which I'm telling you the future looks pretty bright. And so bismuth is what we sometimes use for hydrogen sulfide now in our practice. So going back to this, we now know this was not a good template for irritable bowel syndrome. It is not these things per se. I am not saying stress, anxiety, depression don't exacerbate symptoms of heart disease, blood pressure, and all other diseases. What I'm saying is these are not the causes, but they may be cofactors in, in this condition. And if you want to know what, what's known about the microbiome, this pretty much sums up a lot of the information. I'm not going through it, but this is a really uh, sort of a, a summary slide of everything. So in conclusion, uh, irritable bowel syndrome is commonly a small bowel microbiome disease now. SIBO is an important contributor to IBS, and the most important organisms you're going to hear about from Jason are E. coli and Klebsiella. You're going to hear that. So we now know those characters, and methanogens, M. smithii, is the character that produces methane and constipation. Hydrogen sulfide is the new kid, but it's going to be the most important because it's a direct line to diarrhea. More hydrogen sulfide, more diarrhea. So you've got to get that down. And then these antibodies really make IBS a disease. It's a disease now, not a syndrome. And uh, I don't know when we're going to get word of the rid of the term syndrome for IBS. But now that we understand all these targets, the path to drug development and treatment is going to change immensely. And, and you'll see that in the coming, um, coming weeks or years or months. Depends, depends on the drug. So um, thank you so much.